Hey everyone, today I'm going to be doing a one month review on the Blaze King catalytic stove. I had it installed about one month ago. I have only shut it off twice for a day so I can let it cool down and do a proper cleaning. And today I'm going to be starting it up for the third time to show you guys exactly what I've learned over the past month and how to operate it to its best. So this thing has been running non-stop minus two or three days over the past month. And when it's running, I don't have to use the furnace at all. I originally installed this when heating oil prices were really high. I filled my oil tank earlier this year, and it cost me $800 when it was only halfway full. It didn't even need that much. That's when fuel prices were at $6. They're finally back down to $4.25 right now. But I'm going to give you a little look over at the stove, and I'm going to talk about some things people had problems with in my last video. I was surprised how many people liked my last video. I'll link that in the description, my original startup with zero experience running one of these. And right here I have my bin right underneath the window because I pulled my little wagon garden cart over here, and I just put it right through the window. It being inside the house, it allows it to heat up. I'm preheating the wood, and it's also drying because a lot of times it comes in wet or snow-covered. You don't want to be throwing wet wood into here because it can cause damage to the catalytic converter. Also, cold wood doesn't burn as much, and it can cause condensation. One thing a lot of people in my original video had problems with is complaining that this thing is too close to stuff. Building code around here is... 18 inches between the stove and the wall, or anything on the sides. Three feet clearance in the front, and this meets all those standards. It was installed professionally by a stove company. Last video, there was a second stack of water bottles here, but I already used them, and that was still 18 inches. The stove company saw that. A lot of people were telling me, it's going to heat up your water and put microplastics in it. This thing barely produces heat on the side. It can burn you. But none of this ever gets warm to the touch at all. Only the stuff near the ceiling gets a little warm because it pools in the rafters, which is normal. In the back here, it's got 18 inches before a concrete wall. Doesn't really matter with that. And here is just about 18 inches from the thing. Maybe a little less, but the stove company saw that. And this does not get hot at all. And this thing has ran for two weeks at a time, twice. So I'm going to show you guys how I start this up and how I clean it out. So you start a fire in here, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. First, I'm going to clean it out. My last fire in here didn't go as long. That's only a couple days of ash, but I realized for it to get up to this height, the ash, that's about two weeks of burning. Very efficient stove. You can let this thing run for a full day without putting anything in it. It has a drawer right here. Where you can simply open a little plug there with the tool it came with, which is right here. I have yet to do this. I find this thing not very helpful. If I want to do it when it's still running, I will put all the hot embers and burning things over to the side, and I will use my fire shovel to shovel it out into a metal bucket. I have yet to use this. But before I start it back up, I'm going to be going ahead and giving this a good cleaning and wipe down everything here. Clean up the floor. And I just bought this, the cheapest fireproof rug on Amazon. It's really thin, but I only wanted it so the floor doesn't get dirty with ash when things pop out when you open the door. So most of what I have on the property is pine. And a lot of people didn't like that I was burning pine, saying how dangerous that was. Well, that is a myth. The stove company told me it, and then again, people in the comments were saying, I'm going to ruin the catalyst in here with the creosote from the pine. So I went ahead and called the company Blaze King and asked them about that. The only way you are going to clog up the catalyst or get a chance of a chimney fire is of two reasons. You never clean the chimney at all over many years which I'm going to go ahead and clean it every single year when I'm done, since this is going to be the primary heat source. Originally, it was just to help me out with my bills, but now that I see how cheap it is to actually run it, 
it's going to be a full-time thing. So Blaze King told me, first off the bat, don't worry about the catalyst. It came with a 10-year warranty, so if anything malfunctions, they're going to replace it. They explained to me that it gets so hot that creosote's not going to build up in there. But just in case, every now and then, every couple months, just burn a creosote sweeping log in there. They also told me, just burn hardwoods in there and that will get rid of any creosote if it occurs. Blaze King told me on the phone that the myth with pine creating chimney fires, the reason that myth even exists is because someone will be in here burning hardwoods that aren't seasoned properly, or they didn't clean it for many years. Hardwoods that aren't seasoned, wet wood, creates creosote just like pine. And pine, when you finally go in there and heat it up, if there is any creosote, you could have had fires in there for years not burning pine. You go and you burn pine, it starts a fire, and people blame it on the pine. It's because pine can burn sometimes twice as hot. It burns really hot, and that's why it can be the last straw to starting a fire inside your chimney. It just burns real hot. Pine is not usually the number one choice to burn because it only has about half the BTU value of hardwoods, meaning you're going to go through about twice as much to heat your house. I'm burning pine because I have 90% pine trees in my forest, and I had over 50 of them fall down that I'll show at the end of the video. Couldn't believe it. But if the catalyst goes bad for any reason, that's not my fault. In 10 years, it can be replaced. Also, it's not a big concern either because the catalyst is only 150 bucks. If I get through the whole heating season with pine and it happened to break, does it really matter that much? You can buy a kit from Blaze King. It's 150 bucks the catalyst with the fireproof gasket for it. Right here is the model number if anyone's interested in the stove. So here we are. You don't have to clean it out that well. I did just for video purposes so I can show you around. And you can see on the screen there's a bunch of dust in the air just from cleaning it out. I always brush off the gasket here to make sure it seals because every now and then by accident I'll crunch a piece of ash in there. So right here to get this out, if you were that nitpicky, maybe once a year I'll do it, stick the vacuum cleaner down in there. Right here is the plug I was talking about, you use that tool and you can just push it all down in there. If you were doing that, I would recommend doing it probably every day or two because this right here is only about, let's say four days of ash. You have to bring this bucket out two or three times if you let this thing go over two weeks. Two weeks it gets up to about here. And a lot of that, you see, isn't even completely burned. So if you look inside this catalytic stove, unlike a normal wood stove, you have this right here, the catalyst. So you can remove this is the heat shield to get to it. I'll just wash my hands. That right there. When this thing's operating, just like the catalytic converter in a car, that will glow bright red. This stove, you do not have to have a fire burning in it. No, you do not. This stove is designed so that you can just go ahead, make a fire, and then you shut the damper enough where you literally are smothering the fire. You want it to be a very smoky fire. The smoke goes in here, heats up, and it burns the smoke and gases from the wood. That is how this thing operates and makes its heat, and that's why it's so efficient. You're supposed to be able to run the stove with the proper wood for up to 30 or even 40 hours on a slow burn. 
12 hours if it's on high. I'm going to show you exactly how to operate this thing. So right now, this is called the bypass in the back. Not actually a damper. It's called the bypass. There's a lever on the side where I'm going to open that thing up while we're starting the fire. And now you can see up the flue pipe. And immediately when I did that, it started sucking in. Already, there's air going up the pipe. On really cold nights, if this thing's not on, you can feel little drafts and stuff coming out of it. But it's really not that bad. So let's see what I'm doing. Closed. Open. That is this lever here. Closed. Open. Now this handle, see? It comes right off like nothing. The first time I did that... I was like, oh no, did I break it? Nope, this thing just comes off if you need it to for whatever reason. So when you're starting a fire, you want it facing forward, which means it's wide open, the bypass. Now we're going to build a little fire. This is how I do it, the simplest way I have found. Rip up a cardboard box, going to put that in there. Here's a whole bunch of kindling from the yard, just a bunch of dead branches from the pine trees, and then I'm going to throw a bunch of really small pieces of wood like this on top of that kindling and then we'll throw a couple bigger logs in there and then this thing takes about 20 minutes to get up to heat where we can start the catalyst all right so i got the cardboard on the bottom a whole bunch of kindling in there that kindling is a little damp because i just got it where it's raining outside the catalyst in here is actually sensitive to wet wood that's why it needs to be properly seasoned Things like pine take 6 to 12 months. Things like oak can take 1 to 2 years. But typically most trees are about 1 year to season them properly. And moisture can actually damage the catalyst, I was told by the company. But the bypass is open and this moisture is going to go right out the flue before we even engage the catalyst. Here's some smaller pieces that we'll be able to catch really easily. going to go ahead and put... A much larger piece in there to catch. And here's a really dried out piece of pine log. Now let's get the lighter. Alright, lighting it. Lighting it a second spot. Alright, the smoke is already getting sucked right up the chimney. Great. I remember the first time I did this, I accidentally had that shut so it came into the room. Alright, we finally got it going good. It's definitely going up the pipe really good now. Sucking nice air in so we can leave it open at the moment. I didn't do this the second time, but I did this the first time I ever used it and I just did it again. You need to take like a piece of paper and wave it over that hole so it can start a current or I was told by the wood stove company even stick a blowtorch in there to get a little bit of a current going because I didn't get a little bit of a current going and there's a little bit of smoke in the room if you can see that. But now that there's a current going, that's what happens sometimes when you have a really long stove pipe because this isn't just going out the wall like if it was on the second floor. This pipe is going for a good 50 feet. And sometimes it's hard to get a draft going, even though I thought I could feel a little one initially. Now this thing's going to go really good. That's not going to burn out. The kindling is already starting to burn. Cardboard works really good for getting that initial blast of air to go up the chimney. Now this usually takes about 20 minutes before this gets into active mode. You're not even going to see that move for probably 10 minutes. Stove is going to take a while to heat up. It takes about an hour for the whole thing to fully heat. The gauge on the pipe is finally starting to move. We're finally getting the bigger pieces of wood catching. It's been about five minutes. 
Now I'm gonna go ahead and just leave the door cracked for now to give it plenty of air and I'm just gonna sit around watching it. Always leave it attended unless the door is shut. As far as the stains on the glass, they come and go. Sometimes I'll come down here, it'll be mostly clear. Sometimes it starts to carbon up like that, but they do sell cleaner too. It's always fun to watch it. This room gets really nice and warm. This room gets around 80 degrees. It keeps the entire house at around 72. It can get the house up to 80 if it wanted to. This stove, I intentionally oversized it to make sure it could do the job. This house has a footprint of 740 square feet. That's around maybe 1,400 square feet because I have the basement here and I have one floor above me. And maybe 1,500 square feet, everything. This thing is rated for 2,500 square feet, so it's more than enough to keep this house heated. The cat loves to sit on this chair in this warm room because it radiates a lot of heat forward. But to the sides, nothing heats up at all, surprisingly. And also down here, I bought this thermometer for up in the ceiling. You see right now it's reading about 70. It'll probably read around 90 later on, even when the room is around 80, because it pools up here in the ceiling. When I'm running the stove, that door has to be open. If this door was shut, it would overheat this room, and it would actually cause a flood. Let me explain. There's a toilet down here, but there's also a toilet upstairs, which has a wax ring. The wax ring typically melts and gets soft between 110 and and 120 degrees so if the ceiling ever got above 100 degrees i would start getting concerned a plumber brought that to my attention but even this thing running full blast i have never seen the ceiling get more than 95 worst case scenario i gotta take the toilet off and put a um rubber seal underneath it when i had the stove installed it could not fit through this door they had to take the window off the frame, and they had to make a ramp in here with 4 by 4s and they slowly pushed it down the ramp. That's how it came in here. If it's ever going to leave, it has to go through this window, or this door jam has to be broken apart, they said. Alright, I just added some much larger pieces of wood in there that will be able to catch really fast. Pine is always the best kindling to start off with. Then I'm going to throw some hardwoods in there. Hardwoods burn for much longer. That's why they're usually preferred. But we do got a lot of pine around here. And you see some smoke right here. It's billowing, but it's not coming out. It's just going around and getting sucked back up the chimney. Alright, so here's the gauge on the pipe. Starting to get up there. Here's the gauge for the actual catalyst. We're not ready to activate it yet. We got wanted to get to this little notch before we engage it, and I'll show you that in a moment. If I touch the bolt, it is warm to the touch. I can't touch it for more than a few seconds. Still completely cold on the top of the stove. Something I've learned over the past couple weeks, when you're opening this from either shut or just cracked, you want to open it slowly to allow more air in there to start sucking up the chimney. Because if you just grab the door and open it, sometimes you can shove a big cloud of smoke into the house but this thing except initial startups like i did today again by accident you don't get any smoke smell at all i thought everything in the house was going to smell like smoke from having a wood stove yep you just got to open it carefully uh got a little bit in there but no there we go now it's just about all going in you just got to know how to open it and that's going to still take more skill on my end You know, a lot of people in my own family always ask me, why do I open a window like that? Well, here's the reason. Cold air is coming in the bottom, and the smoky hot air is going out the top. If you want to properly vent a room that only has one window, you do that. There is current forcing out the top and current pouring in the bottom, and it gets the smoke out of the room. Because I have this room currently isolated. I have the door shut until the room gets too hot because... Every startup I've had, it smokes a little bit, you know. 
So that's how I stop it from going in. This is an unfinished room. I don't really care about, even though I do keep a few clothes in here. So the wood stove, it's safe to leave running when you're not home, when you're sleeping, as long as the door is shut. If you're in the room, not paying attention to it, I would never do more than just leave it cracked. Unless I'm sitting here, I would never leave it open like this. Because all it takes is, you know that crackly wood? To throw it across the room and ignite something. You never know where that could go if you're not paying attention to it. So unless I'm looking at this, giving it my full attention, that door is shut. All right, this thing's going hot right now. Let's see what the catalyst is saying. Oh, it's getting close. The bucket of ash I'll simply just dump in the forest or throw into the vegetable garden. Ooh, it just shifted a lot. We got room to throw more wood in there. Let's do it. Got a giant piece of hardwood there. Here looks like a big piece of maple. Let's get that in there. Hardwood is definitely the better choice, but the pine is free for me. I had to buy all this hardwood you're seeing me putting in here. I purposely bought a large wood stove instead of the smaller model of this, which is called the Princess, because I have a lot of logs in the yard. Anything that's like smaller than 8 inch diameter, I'll just throw it in their hole. I don't even have to split it and it'll take care of it. One time I threw a log in there that was maybe two inches shorter than the door laying on its side, you know, and that thing probably had a 14 inch diameter. Just pushed it in there with the hot ash. It smoldered in there for like a day and it kept the house warm. That was nice. Wow, that piece right there of the maple, that caught on fire real fast. You know, so I don't burn my house down. This rug I bought on Amazon for 30 bucks, it's getting returned, and I'm just going to go ahead and continue mopping it. I'd rather a concrete floor in front of this. This is not fireproof. If a big ember fell on this, this would light. I swear it would. Maybe this is fireproof, but this is not fireproof. I just put something hot against it, and it melted. This is going right back. This thing's a piece of junk. All right, everyone, after 20 minutes, we are finally hot enough to activate the catalyst. Later on, that little arrow will be around here somewhere. Now, this is just to tell you the catalyst is active. So even if the little arrow is all the way over here, Blaze King said that is not overheating. That's why you should have another gauge up here to tell you what's going on with the pipe. So here's how we activate the catalyst. Shut the door. To start off with, put your heat control on high. I have found that if it's on low, it'll actually smother with pine because, I don't know, because I guess the ash doesn't go as hot. But if you're burning hardwood, you can have it all the way on low and it'll smolder for at least 30 hours, in my experience. Now that that's on high, we are going to shut the bypass where I was showing you up the pipe and it's going to force it through the catalyst as soon as I flip this, it's going to force it through, and that thing instantly turns bright red. Let me show you. I'm going to shut the light off. All right, everyone. So now we're going to flip this, which is going to shut off the bypass you saw going up the pipe just to get the fire going. Now by shutting this, we just shut the bypass going to the chimney, and now all the smoke is forced through the hot catalyst now, and it will burn up the smoke a whole bunch meaning more heat in the house and fewer emissions up the pipe, less smoke. And this thing will turn on pretty soon, which is really cool. It generates the power for the electric motor just with the heat. I think I may have got ripped off on that. I just bought one on Amazon that's red. 16 bucks. This came from Tractor Supply for 90 Maybe I got ripped off on this one. Or maybe it's just a better brand and it'll outlast the other one by a whole ton. If the glass wasn't really dirty, you'd see that thing glowing bright red. It's bl it, it's usually dark, but when you flip that within 5-10 seconds, it starts glowing. I'm going to show you old stock footage from a different time when this wasn't dirty of the stove 
working right now. Look up at the top. You see the where the catalyst is in there? Watch, I'm going to go and close the damper now that we're up to temp. Watch what happens. Instantly, the catalyst starts glowing bright red, just like a catalytic converter. It glowing bright red as the smoke goes through it helps burn it further. So it won't be smoking as much outside, less emissions, and it's creating more heat. And if I go ahead and open it back up, within 10 seconds that thing will be dark again as it loses its heat. But as soon as I did this, it started burning really well, very hot. I had to shut the light off in here because there's so much glare. All right, now this thing could sit like this for probably the rest of the night until I'm ready for bed. I'll come down and load it up a little bit. So if I open the door now, smoke would just come right out into the room because it's using some pressure it's got to make it go through the catalyst. So what you do is open the bypass back up. The catalyst is now has stopped working. The smoke is going up there. Open it just like this. Give it like 10 seconds for air to start going in. Give it enough time to get suction back on the chimney. Open it a little bit more. Make sure the smoke's not going to come out. Make sure it's going up the chimney. And now you can use your poker to mess with the fire. Add more wood. And it will quickly flare back up now that it finally has air. Because what I was doing before for the most part was smothering it to purposely create smoke for the catalyst to heat up with. And the gas is from the wood. So now, if it gets too hot, you can mess with this. This is basically your thermostat now. Turn it to half. Turn it way up here. It'll smolder as little as possible. In my experience, if you're burning only pine, that can actually cause it to go out. Hardwoods, it'll keep burning on low. But for pine, it's got to be here at the lowest. I'm going to keep it on high for now until it completely heats up. It's now been maybe 25 minutes or so. Not that hot yet. I can keep my hand on there for a second or two. The sidewalls, still cold to the touch, but they will become hot, but not really radiating. None of this gets hot. Out the front, it makes the chairs and stuff way over here actually heat up. Really throws heat out the front. Still completely cold, but it will get hotter. And then this thing will start working. Back here, the thin metal, this is all really hot now. This will start working sooner or later. Look at that. We're quickly climbing on the gauge. So everyone, since I got the stove a month ago, the coldest temperature I have observed outside with this thing running was negative 10. Here in this area, we can get down to negative 30, sometimes even more in the winter. I am confident that this will be able to keep up because even that negative 10 degree night... It didn't even have to be on high to keep the whole house at a comfortable 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Even on days when it's like 50 degrees, you just turn it way down and it keeps the whole house comfortable. It doesn't overheat or anything. It's perfect. I'm glad I got a big stove. It doesn't overheat the tiny house. Not at all. In fact, in a few years, I'm thinking about getting another wood stove that's actually going to go in the kitchen. I want to get a cooking stove if I ever get one at a good price. I almost bought one off a guy the other day. It was a cooking stove, and it was from Norway. He said it had metric pipes. Simple. Th it's simple. You just have to buy an adapter for it online. It goes. He said he has had. He's had to replace it every couple years of operation because it gets rusty and whatnot. But it's not a big deal. He said he's had that for a while. I passed on it. It was only two hundred bucks. I'm not ready for that yet because I'd have to pay someone thousands to professionally put it in. You know, make sure it's safe and all that. Because this was put in by a stove company. It made my insurance carrier charge me $60 more, which is not bad at all. It's really not. You always want to have some sort of insurance in case something goes wrong. Because I can't afford to build the whole house back again. 
So people were not happy in my original video with us that I didn't even talk about the cost or anything about it in great detail. So the stove itself cost about $4,000, not installed. Installed, it was around $8,000. This year, there is a federal... Uh, no, last year, 2022, there was a federal rebate of 26% meaning that I'm going to get 26% of that back, which is about $2,000 off of my taxes when I go to file. If I was to do this in 2023, the rebate has gone up now to 30%, but it maxes out at, I believe, $3,000. So it was a good thing I did this last year because last year was the year to do bigger projects, especially if you're someone who wants one of those giant wood burners in their yard to run their baseboard heating system or radiators. If you know what I'm talking about, I'll show a picture on the screen. Those things there can cost tens of thousands depending on how much, you in put, how much you're uh, putting into it. This year would be the year for a smaller stove or a replacement of an existing stove where you don't have to pay for the pipe. The piping up the side of the house is stainless steel double wall. It's about $100 a foot. That's how the price of the project got up to around $8,000. $8,000 seems like a giant price, but the way heating oil prices were earlier this year, they were $6 and they're quickly, they dropped down now to $4.25. At prices of four twenty five, this will pay for itself within four years. At prices around six dollars and higher, it would have paid for itself in just about two years. So I'll get my money back. Plus, this gives you peace of mind, because you see how the way the world is recently. If anything was to go wrong with the supply chain, what what if you can't get fuel one time? It's always good to have something like this. It doesn't require electricity at all. Even pellet stoves require either a battery backup or a blower fan needs electricity. This thing doesn't need electricity at all, and it has a life expectancy. If you use it constantly like I am, 15 years, the catalyst has a guarantee of 10 years. They'll replace it if anything breaks. If it has a 10-year warranty, I'm expecting it to go a long time. But if it does happen to carbon up, even if they give me crap saying it's my fault for burning something wrong in it, like green wood. They said green wood's the only thing that would do it. They said pine's not an issue. A lot of their customers do it. They've tested it. There's not a problem with pine at all. Like people in my last video's comments thought, that's not the issue. It's burning wood that's not seasoned. It causes more creosote to build up. And even if they didn't replace it, I'm not concerned. It's a $150 part. It comes with the gasket. I watched a video. The catalyst pops in and out pretty easily doesn't even use any screws it's just really in there snug you just give it nice taps with a mallet into place with the, with its gasket and you see right now there's a few flames in there you know it's burning at its hottest if i was to turn it down the flames would go away is it at its hottest yes it is at its hottest now that we're up in the temp usually i wait for it to go over here but you can already start to mess with it top is going to continue to get hotter this thing's almost completely heated up sidewalls are starting to get warm but i can still keep my hand on there indefinitely i'm going to go ahead and turn it to half you're going to see most of that glowing red and flames now go away it'll start making more smoke the catalyst is going to be in there you can't see it but it'll be in there burning red hot like in that flashback i showed you this thing should be ready to start moving any minute. Oh, just that little touch. It got it going. Once it heats up more, that'll spin faster. That helps circulate it and blow it out the door. Speaking of that, I got to go ahead and open that door. Originally, in my first video, I was talking about cutting a hole in the ceiling and maybe putting like a fan in there to force it up. Or force cold air down, you know, to circulate it. Because even my heating system, the forced air furnace... Every pipe you see here is blowing into the rooms, and it's more of an open concept house, so it uses the staircase as a return down into the basement to get to the furnace. But this door, it seems to be enough. You got the hot air billowing out the top and right up the stairs. It radiates through the floor. You got the cold air along the floor coming in here, the same concept I talked about with the window. 
Now that the smoke is just about gone, I can go ahead and shut that. But it's fairly warm out. It's 55. Look at that. The room has already got up to 75 degrees. It'll climb maybe to around 80. And that's as hot as the room gets. The rest of the house will start heating back up. And now we're going to go into a really cold stretch of weather. It's not going to get out of the 20s at all for the next few days. A couple nights it's going to be down into the negative temperatures. And this thing will keep us going all the way. You see, those are a little bit of like ash on the top of it. That's basically from me cleaning it out. You know, it gets around the room and stuff. Just got to do a little bit of dusting every now and then. That thing's still heating up. Well, now I'm going to bring you outside and I'm going to show you some videos I made earlier of my wood piles, my manual log splitter, and I'm going to show you my forest and how I manage it. We had, on the 22nd of December, 47 known trees come down on the property. I'm working on cutting those up. I want to get them cut up before spring because I want the seedlings to be able to grow and not be smothered, you know, because if they're not getting sunlight once they start growing again, they're all going to die. So I have to clean up all those trees before spring. I only got eight of them cut up so far from the 47. That's going to take a while. I'm probably going to have to ask some friends for help getting that cut up. All right, everyone. So outside, here's some of my wood pile. The stuff here that's cut is really good hardwoods. Over here under that tarp is really good hardwoods. That tree just fell down last week. It'll be burned next year. Behind all the hardwoods, there's a large pile, another large pile of nice seasoned pine, which I'm about to split, and that will get thrown into the fire. All this is seasoned pine. I put it around the trash cans so they can't blow away. Right here's a log shed right behind the house with a bunch of nice split seasoned pine. Right here is a large pile of nice seasoned pine and a little bit of aspen. I'm slowly depleting that. That'll be gone by the end of the year as I slowly split it and put it through the basement window. All right, everyone. This is where I get my firewood anytime the bin downstairs gets full. This is my wagon that I use for bringing the logs over to the house so I can split them and put them through the basement window. Right now it's full of my chainsawing, my tree straps, everything I use for logging. I'll show you that in just a moment. Wagon's being occupied right here at the minute. This right here, I can't believe how many people made fun of me in my original video of the stove for using this log splitter. Why exactly did so many people say this was a bad idea? Everyone was saying that I'm lazy. Go ahead and use an axe. Yeah, right. You can't use an axe to go through a log that is like 14 inches or even bigger. This, I can put it in there, crank it through it, crank it through it again with very little effort. It's just a little bit time consuming because it's a hand pump log splitter. Now, you can't use an axe on a log that's 14 inches in diameter like a lot that I have. What's going to happen is the axe is going to get stuck in it. Whenever I have to do that manually, I need to use a bunch of wedges with this sledgehammer. See that? I have this in here because occasionally I mess up and I get the chainsaw stuck in the tree. So I use this wedge, pound it in there until the saw gets loose. No, but this thing really does work good. This came from Harbor Freight for only less than $200. I only got this thing instead of an electric one or a gas-powered one, preferably, because couldn't afford it this year. And this was really cheap. A gas one is going to run around $1,700. A good electric one is $400 and up. They have one on Amazon that's $900, which is a really good electric one. That thing can produce up to 18 tons of pressure. This is a 10 ton of pressure. All the cheap electric ones are like 5 ton. I wasn't sure if they could do the job since sometimes this thing struggles on the wet wood. It works really good if it's already seasoned like everything I'm burning. Good workout. See how slow it moves? But it's got tons of pressure. It can go through all kinds of logs. <laughs> Thank you. 
All right, everyone, let me show you all the tree damage out in the yard from the last giant storm. I believe that was on December 22nd out here in the forest behind the house. We lost 47 known trees, and I don't know, there could be more underneath. So this is a trail here. When I first got this property three years ago, it was beautiful, the forest. The house wasn't. It was an abandoned building that I've been slowly fixing up over the years. Spent like two years pooping in holes in the woods. But that's what I wanted to finally be able to get out of the city. It took two years to get the plumbing back on. Now this is going to be perfect for heating the house. It's basically free heat, except for the maintenance of the power equipment. All these logs here are going to sit season after a year. I'm going to bring them over to my log splitter and... Yeah, they can be burned in the house. Just take a look at this. It was so much worse if I came out here a week ago. I've been working on this a week straight. That's why I haven't been uploading. So I'm burning all the branches, all the debris. Last year I was kind of worried, but I didn't do it. I just didn't want to. The whole forest floor was debris. It was scary how much debris there was if there was ever to be a forest fire. It would rip through the property so fast. That's why I'm trying to get rid of as much debris as possible. I understand I just can't do it all at once. I have to do other things in life. This would probably take two months straight to clean up the debris in this forest. So this gigantic white pine that you see going through the fire, I'm trying to burn it in half, actually. That fell down a year ago. More trees fell down. You see that one right there? There was three trees going across the trail a couple days ago. Like you see over here is one of them. That one actually fell that way, it looks like. This tree here broke about a year ago. This one just came down during this storm. If you see the stump all crumpled, this one came down during this storm. I'm just leaving it like this because you see nature naturally split this for me. After a year, I can just grab that stuff and burn it. After a year, I can just cut, cut. It's naturally split just the way it broke. This tree right here, I'm going to have to take down some other time. See this green one that just came down? I cleaned this up because you see, look at the beautiful moss everywhere. I'm trying to protect this. As soon as I'm done working in these areas, I'm gonna allow this years to recover. Beautiful moss. There's tiny little pine trees ever. There's tiny little uh, pine trees everywhere. That's not a pine tree. That are gonna quickly fill in these open spots. So here, there's a tree down, a tree on top of it. This tree just came down. There's that one over there that I kinda cut up like three years ago but ignored it. There's that tree bent, another tree bent, stuck up there. That'll have to wait until another time. Wow, there's actually a partially dead maple. Maple's the best stuff to burn. Look at this dead one standing tall. I'm not even bothering taking down dead trees at the moment. There's just too much debris to clean up. Because this is a huge fire hazard when it dries out. It's hard to get the fire going right now because it's wet. This wet time is when we're allowed to do open burning and do um, controlled burns on the forest floor. I'm avoiding doing any kind of controlled burn because these trees basically aren't made to have forest fires. I know out west it's natural for, for a small fire to come through every couple years and clean up the forest floor. And I know also out there decades of them preventing those natural fires it has allowed debris to build up and now they have giant ones everywhere. I know the heat of the fire has most likely killed this one tree right here, but I had to find an area out here to make a fire since it would be very difficult to haul it all out. Now any tree like this that's moss covered, I'm leaving all these ones here because those aren't really much of a fire hazard unless it was extremely dry. Along the trail, I'm leaving all these piles like this of logs, and when they're seasoned, I can bring that wagon you saw back there. I purposely made all these trails wide enough that the wagon can get down them to collect firewood. 
you know, this was the first year I ever started heating with wood, and I never intended on doing that until I saw fuel prices got to $6.70. And oddly enough, right after I put it in the wood stove, diesel prices immediately started dropping. Right now they're four fifty, and they're rapidly dropping. Right here is more logs. These are actually nice and seasoned because it fell down last year. Look at that, it's naturally split for me. I just had to cut it up a little bit. That can actually go in the stove this year. A couple more logs. You go down the trail right here. Up here there's still blockages because this right here you see it's like a big triangle so I can uh, nice and conveniently get the wagon through here to clean this up. You see there's more trees down over there. You see those trees are stuck, two of them. The bottoms I actually cut off to get them off the trail. Now they're just stuck up. And at some point over the next year, I'll eventually get those down. Again, there are 40-something of them still stuck. See that? There's a big bunch of them there stuck up. If I go down this trail here... Yeah, down this trail is a campsite I made a few years back. When I got the property, there was like three campsites out here. Supposedly, that was the people who used to live here. Uh, grandkids used all the campsites around the property. And some of them I fixed up that I liked. Look at that. Look at those trees. Isn't that cool how they broke in different directions like that? These logs are useless. That's just a giant pile of mushy, rotten logs. Creatures can live in that. This is a fire pit I made a few years back out of an old propane tank. I called the propane company saying, Hey, Amerigas, do you want your tank back? Because I wasn't sure if it was bought or leased. So I did this to it because they told me, um... Yeah, we'll take the tank if you pay the $1,100 bill remaining on it. No, I'm not paying that. I don't even use propane. Um, over here is another pile. That's for the campsite. Whoever uses it next can, can do that. Right here is a drum of a clothes dryer that could be used as a fire pit. It could be moved wherever to use it. And this actually came out of a clothes dryer that was used as a shooting target and that's actually good because it's a lot of holes to let air in and you see the whole forest floor is debris you can't even walk through most of it so slowly over time this is all going to be cleaned up i have some people over the next summer coming over you know just to use the property to do some camping with their children and they can help clean up some of this you see right here the trail this tree just fell across it. I'm going to cut it open, the trail, but leave everything off to the sides and eventually get to it. Look at this. I couldn't even see through here a couple days ago. I'm really making progress with this. This is a giant white pine that was dead. I purposely dropped this because it was so close to the campground. It was so sturdy. It was hard to get down with the chainsaw. It would it would have stood it would have stood strong for decades with just dead branches occasionally falling off it. But I didn't want that hazard next to the campsite, so I dropped it. I even made a little chair out of it. And look at this big pile of debris behind it that'll eventually have to be burned. I love the moss. I hope the moss starts spreading, and I hope that these open areas caused by the storms get a lot more trees going. I know that pine trees have been having a lot of problems in recent years. Um, lately, we've been getting droughts, and that weakens the pine trees, so bugs just attack them. So a lot of them have been dying. I've noticed dozens and dozens of pine trees for no apparent reason dying. And it has to be bugs. I cut them open. There's no rot. And I find out it's like worms, larvae, eating underneath the bark between the wood. Sometimes I cut them open and there's thousands of carpenter ants in them. But carpenter ants aren't really a problem. They're natural. They're not invasive. That's normal to sometimes find a colony of them in a tree. They're not that bad. But the invasive bugs cause the major problems. Let me bring you down my trail a little bit. I have a camera here, and you've seen videos I've posted, different animals walking across this thing. A lot of animals actually use these trails. It's not just my property here. It's every property around here has these blowdowns everywhere. So when you actually cut a trail, animals use it because it's the easiest place to go. Now, what you're seeing here, that's not sawdust. I bought something called protein pellets for deer and turkeys. Animals didn't really like them. It was out here days before it rained, got rained on, and it just turned it to mush. It looked like animal pellets, and it smelled like yogurt. 
um, dried yogurt bites for some reason. Anyways, the piles out here, I could see like little tunnels made through it, like rodents, or maybe a bird was eating it. And look at this, we got water trickling over the top of the ice. Today's a nice warm 30 degree day. That's why I have no t-shirt on. Anytime it's above freezing, I don't even wear a jacket because I think it's really nice out. I run hot, I know that. Look at this, got a nice swamp here. When I built the bridge, I purposely made this channel to get it underneath, but I also made sure to make a dam right there to keep the swamp level nice and high. This runs, I would say, 20% of the year. Basically only a couple days after a snowstorm or during the spring thaw. And that goes all the way down here to the drainage ditch by the edge of the road. So right here, there's another tree. This thing is pretty well stuck up here. I'm going to get this one down eventually. If you look, it's wedged between these two trees. And eventually that's going to make these trees crooked. And that's a nice maple tree. I really want to get that straightened back out. So I'm probably going to just drop it to the ground today to make sure nothing else happens. If we go up this trail right here, you see I made all these trails wide enough so the wagon can get down to these wood piles. I even made this bridge wide enough for that wagon could get out here and get lumber. All I have to do is put blocks there so the wheels can bump up over it. Because without that bridge, it would sink so deep into the mud. So right here, you see that tree fell down about a year ago, uprooted. This one just came down and you see I just dropped it over to the side you know it's still stuck eventually i will eventually drop those completely and get them cut up i just have a lot of work cut out for myself so i'm not gonna rush through this whole thing over a period of a month and stress myself out i'm gonna wait and slowly do it over a course of a year or two now i couldn't walk down this trail at all yesterday many more trees came down Look at this, this is a maple tree I cut out of the way and you see it's actually still alive. Maybe it can straighten itself out. It's gonna be a weird looking tree if it is able to survive this. On the other side, that maple, it's not big, but maple is really good compared to pine. You gotta burn twice as much pine to make up for the same BTU value of the hardwoods. So right here you see another tree dangerously across. There was actually two of them right there. You see, I dropped it, and I will eventually cut this up in the next few days. That's the top of the tree. I'll deal with that another time. You see, it's pretty straight, so it's not putting much pressure on other trees. And that's actually the property line, if you see those pink ribbons there. So when you're cutting logs like this, I learned this over many attempts of failure. Um, so to make this big enough to fit into the fireplace, I got to gut once here and here. But you only want to cut like 70% through because if your blade hits the ground, you're going to dull in it in no time. 70%, you want to roll the log and do the rest 30% through it. And that's how you don't cut the log and destroy your blades because dirt and grime will destroy it in no time. If the log is too big, there's a tool clicks with a big handle and you roll it over but i know that is going to be a problem so if there's a branch i purposely leave one branch i can use as a handle and when i'm done i will cut it up and this trail here continues down about another hundred feet to the corner of the property and turns you see all the debris here there was a gigantic blow down here about a year ago you see there's tons of debris here but there's also pretty dense, nice, healthy, young trees here. I don't want to hurt them. And I also don't want to hurt this beautiful moss. So this, I think I'm just going to let a lot of it rot here. Especially these logs because they're too rotten to ever burn. The brush, eventually, I'm going to try to get out of here and burn it. I don't want to start a fire in this area. There's just too much beautiful growth. All right, back onto the main trail. Only a couple months back, I had these two trees here fall over. Most of these trees fall over because I do live in a swamp. And this property's always wet. This last storm where we lost 40-something trees, I think that most of the trees fell down. Most of them uprooted. A couple of them you saw back there actually broke. But a lot of them uprooted because it's a swamp and we got four inches of rain that day. Look at this area. These two down. That one just snapped. That one's bent. There's countless other ones here. This whole area is open. 
This used to be shady uh, two years ago, but a couple storms made the whole area clear. And in a timely manner, I want to get all this debris out of here because this debris here, it's blocking the ground. Seedlings can't grow back. And also, there's countless baby trees here. If we get this off fast, they can start growing. If we don't move it, it's going to snuff out. You see all these nice little trees that are only a couple feet tall? They're very eager to grow in. This property here, uh, three years ago, because I didn't make this trail. This trail was always here, and I, I was able to figure out exactly where it was, and I reopened it. There were so many trees across it, and it was blocking all this. Like the year after I removed most of this, these trees took off with growth. This is going to become a nice, dense like tunnel eventually, is my plan, in like 10 years. This will be like a nice, dark tunnel. Most of these logs you see here, it would be too invasive to come in here and just cut them up. Most of them are also too rotten to be burning at this point. These, these ones are okay. This one just came down during this storm. Look at it. Just ripped up that moss. That, that was, I'm going to get out of here, but I'm going to be as careful as possible not to ruin these trees. Yep, that just uprooted. That's okay. You know, over here, around this corner of the trail, completely untouched. Forest is pretty dense there. I think that's why there's no damage, because the wind just couldn't get in there. And the wind unable to get in there, it just couldn't knock anything over. Dense forest blocks wind. When you make these open areas, whether it was done naturally like this, or you cut down the forest, you're more likely to have other trees come down. And, you know, if you cut a row of pine trees, there's a good chance the row behind it's going to die because they're not used to that sun. Also, trees to an extent can communicate with each, with, with each other through the roots. And if they see one next to it's in distress, it can cause the others around it to die. You see, this one right here just came down. And for the most part, I think I'm just going to leave it here and let it rot. These trees will quickly go around it, keeping moisture. That'll rot fast. From the other end where that blowdown was, I'm just going to cut the very tip of it off because once the needles turn brown, that is going to kill a lot of things around it. But these trees here are beautiful. Some of them are already five feet tall, quickly growing in this area that blew down a couple years ago. Yep, you see this area here, really nice growth. We just walk a little bit and it immediately turns pretty dead. You see where all this debris is on the forest floor where I haven't cleaned it up? Nothing's growing really. These trees all came down three or more years ago. Where I actually did a cleanup, look how green it grew back. That's telling me I have to do a cleanup, plus this is a huge fire hazard. This area here looks really nice, all the nice moss. This area is not going to be touched at all. Looks pretty healthy. But I wonder how this area is going to put up with next summer. Sunlight never got here before because we just had a couple trees come down like look at this one right here just uprooted I'm gonna have to figure out how to get that one down Get that one cut up. It's gonna stay like that for a while though Eventually, I'll get around to that Here's one more dead tree that just came down. I'm probably just gonna cut it out of the way of the trail and That looks like it's already so rotten not really good firewood, so that can just sit on the forest floor and rot. I'm going to remove the branches. The logs aren't the, really the fire hazard, it's the brush. This is one of my favorite areas of the trail, where these boardwalks are. I put these here because it's so wet and mushy around here that you walk off the trail, you're going to sink really deep this time of year. Here's the well I put in over the spring. It's warm out today, but... It's going to be very cold again. So this thing, it's completely drained so it can't freeze. The bucket's on it so water can't get in it, freeze and break something. And I found this nice metal trough. I don't know what that's for, but I found it free on the side of the road and it keeps the water away from it so nothing goes back into it. I'm giving that wood a year to dry out before I stain it or something to preserve it. 
I built all this stuff here. Look at this, how much this rotted in just three years since I put this here. It's still effective for keeping the mud out. Right here, for the first time ever during that storm that I said we got four inches and we had about a foot of snow that melted, water came gushing underneath this bridge as intended. You can see right here where the ground's all torn up where water was coming. That right here is coming from where that bridge is I showed you earlier where I said water is underneath it 20% of the time. It sinks into the ground before it even gets down here and... It's rare when it comes down here. I'd say down here, maybe less than 5% of the year, you ever see actual moving water. You just see little standing puddles because the water table's so high. I could dig anywhere in this property and find water trickling under the ground. If I dug a hole here like a foot deep, there'd be water. Summertime, the water table goes down sometimes as much as 10 feet below the ground. Other than that... Some pumps had to run year-round, so I put a drain line in off the hill this year. Really high water table. That's what contributes to the trees falling down. But it also helps the moss and stuff grow. Last year was a really sad year. One of the driest years on record, with 2020 being the record drought for New England ever. But last year seemed worse because... The trees were already stressed from 2020, and 2021 wasn't much better. Anytime I walk out on those trails where I don't intend on burning, I always bring back something to the fire pit. And eventually, over time, that'll make a difference. Here's one of the treetops. Just look how well green pine burns. Imagine when this stuff turns brown and if there was ever a forest fire how big the blaze would be. Like I said, I would rather sacrifice a couple of these bigger trees that might get affected by the heat of the fire than make the fire anywhere else because there's so many seedlings everywhere that are ready to take off. And as soon as I'm done in this area, this fire pit will be abandoned. And within a few years, trees will be fast to take over this area. Where I'm standing right now, just two days ago, I would not have been able to see that wood pile. There was so much debris across here. I made a lot of progress. I was kind of stressed thinking about, I only cut up eight trees so far out of the 40-something that are down. And... I'm realizing now I actually did a lot. We actually got a lot of wood out of this. Just look at the pile here. Got a good amount of it so far out. Over here, I'm going to cut this log up, that log. The ones standing are going to be left for a little while. You know, I did a lot of work today, and it just started raining, and I didn't want my tools to rust up, so I put it away. I probably have about two hours worth of cleanup here, getting stuff into the fire before I call it a day. Let me show you what I just got done. When I cut up a tree that's laying on its side, I purposely do not remove the branches that are sticking out the bottom. I remove those as I'm slicing them into logs. That way I can avoid having to roll the log halfway through the cut. I can just cut it off, zip zip underneath, cut it off, zip zip, works really fast. I was actually gonna cut these up completely today until it started raining, as soon as the saw ran out of gas. I was like, I'm done for today. These big logs down here are too rotten to ever burn. So those are just gonna remain on the forest floor and they will quickly grow in. Look at this tree. It was going through here. And a lot of these pine trees, I didn't even know were underneath it. They would have got suffocated by all the dead trees laying on top of them. As soon as I get all this out of here, these trees are gonna fill in within a few years. You would never know that this happened. Unfortunately, there were a couple small ones I had to cut, and I cut them by accident, a lot of them. But that's okay, these are way too close together. Some of them are eventually gonna have to die anyways. And these ones here that you see leaning, they're leaning against other dead trees, so I don't really care at the moment. 
everything here, all this debris you see here, is not going to be coming through this way. So I'm going to try to clean this up as best as possible so new trees can start growing here. There's already seedlings all over the ground. All the debris you see here is going to be burned back there. I have another trail back there, and I'm going to get it from that side. I'm really happy I decided to make these trails a few years ago because it's making it really easy to ship this wood out with that wagon and I can split it at the house next season. A lot of these logs, honestly, may have to sit here in season for two years because they're pine trees and there still is a lot of sap on them. Even after a year, you can still go up to it and pop bubbles of sap that didn't dry up yet. Sometimes it takes a few years. This can actually be burned in the house this year. These are season, those ones. When I'm going through the logs, like, where's a good example? A lot of times when I get down to the base, I start finding this, which is carpenter ant damage. If I cut this open in the summertime, there'd be ants pouring out of there right now, wanting to bite me. This is okay to burn, but when I get to the point where it's more than half, I don't even bother. I'll just leave it on the forest floor or throw it in the fire. There's other times you run into just plain rot. I don't have a good example. I didn't cut down any trees like that this year. Like, you see right here, this in the middle will burn. But when you start to see this discoloration, it doesn't burn as well. And if the majority of the log is that, it's going to burn very fast and just going to create ash. That makes you have to clean out the fireplace faster. It's not great to burn. But these ones are absolutely perfect. Instead of just going ahead and dragging everything over to the fire, I found it much easier to put it into nice piles with everything going in a nice straight direction. I just put my arms around it and throw it right in the fire. Seems to be the most efficient way. And now that I got the floor of the forest cleaned up, there's nice moss. And look at this. Little tiny pine trees everywhere that'll quickly fill in. Sometime before winter's over, I'll just come in here and remove the logs. Or maybe I can get to that today. It stopped raining. It's going to be really nice when this is all done. You know, another good idea for spots where I can't feasibly burn it, those really dense, beautiful parts of the forest, when I do have debris out there, I think I might just try to make habitat piles. It, it'll basically look like that pile that's sitting on top of the fire, ready to go up in flames. Just leave piles like that. When it's scattered across the forest floor, it's a fire hazard, but when it's in one pile, it's not. And as it decays and rots, it crushes down, and animals will actually live in it. So that might be a good idea for spots where it's just too much labor to bring it out piece by piece to a fire pit. I saw that out west a lot. They encourage people out there who have forests to clean up the forest floor like I've begun doing. And you see piles everywhere. Logging companies make them. The National Forest Park Rangers and Volunteers make them. That might be a good idea out here. It'll look like big beaver lodges all over the woods. It's finally starting to take off after over an hour of drying out. It's a good thing too because I have a lot of piles starting to build up that need to come in here. Look how nice and clean we got it now. I don't have to go in this area here anymore except to retrieve a couple little bundles of sticks that are about to be thrown in the fire. And you see all these nice trees that are about to fill in. And look up, there's a couple pine trees here that are just about dead. But the good news is they don't have many needles now. So the wind is gonna have trouble catching them. Eventually those branches will fall off It'll look like this one here. All the branches have rotted off. It's just a straight tree. Eventually it'll fall down with minimal impact. It's when they fall down full with all their needles when they cause major devastation for the forest. Because look at this. Look where some of these trees landed. Look at all the baby pine trees it killed. 
And you can tell this just died. It's still very stable and stiff. Just lack of sunlight. It was suffocated underneath all the dead needles. And these ones here, you see they're a little bit twisted trying to grow up to the sun. This one here, I just broke the top off. But that'll grow back and this should be pretty healthy looking. Again, I'll get all this from the back. There's a trail back there. You see that little pink ribbon? That's the property line. That's where the trail is. It'll all come out that way into another fire pit. And look at this nice tree. The reason they keep their leaves is because they would rather some animal like a deer eat that instead of destroying the bark. That's why certain trees, baby trees, a lot of oak trees will do that when they're small. Look at this, there's a bunch of blueberry bushes I never knew were in here either. The barrel like that. A bear has been hanging out here over the past year. I think it's because of the drought. It's just looking for food and there's a lot of berries around. So we can't put any food in front of the cameras during the warmer months anymore, just in the winter. This tree right here, this was a beautiful maple tree. It was sad that broke and I had to cut it, but I'm hoping it can grow back from this. I'm pretty sure it will. All right, everyone. So a few of these trees, like I said, they may be too close to the fire. We'll see. Whatever dies, I'll take down and process into firewood. But we needed a spot to be able to burn this stuff. You see, it's more beneficial to kill a couple of these trees rather than have all these seedlings die out from the debris and it's a big forest fire hazard. Anyways, I hope today's video of how I manage my land and how I use it to keep the forest healthy and heat the house was interesting. Thanks for watching and have a great day. The reason I haven't uploaded to this channel in like a week and I probably won't upload for another week after this I'm just simply taking a break. You know, for the past seven years, if you go back and look through my videos, I have uploaded almost every day for all those years. And this year alone, 2022, I have uploaded nearly every single day. And, you know, I gotta slow down a little bit. I'm just doing too much. At any given time, I have so many projects and video ideas I'm doing at the same time. I just gotta slow it down a little bit and I'm taking a couple week break. I've never done that before. I'm always filming something. Days I'm not uploading, it means I'm probably off grid doing something. I'm just taking a little bit of a break and then I'm gonna get back into things towards the end of January.